Muy buenos días y bienvenidos al segundo día de simposio. Eh, estamos muy contentos de verlo de nuevo. We welcome our international speakers. Hoy hablaremos de salud, ecología y bienestar en tiempos de COVID-19. Eh, tengo el placer de presentarle la primera ponencia de hoy, un enfoque ecológico de la salud para el horizonte postpandémico. La charla será dictada por Laura Menatti y Cristian Saborido. Laura Menatti es investigadora, profesora en filosofía medioambiental y teorías del paisaje. Es investigadora asociada del Centro Passage de Ceneres de Bordeaux y colabora con la Escuela de Arquitectura y Paisaje de Bordeaux. Entre sus líneas de investigación figura la relación entre salud, paisaje y medio ambiente desde una perspectiva interdisciplinaria que aborda tanto la medicina como la filosofía y la psicología. Laura, además, colabora desde muchos años con nuestro Centro de Humanidades. Cristian Saborido es profesor titular de Filosofía de la Ciencia en el Departamento de Lógica, Historia y Filosofía de la Ciencia de la Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia, UNED, en Madrid, donde imparte las asignaturas de Filosofía de la Ciencia, de la Biología, Filosofía de la Medicina, Bioética e Introducción al Pensamiento Científico. Sus líneas de investigación principales son la filosofía de la biología y la filosofía de la medicina. Los dejo con Laura y Cristian. Buenos días, muchas gracias por invitarnos. Voy a hablar en inglés y compartir pantalla. Creo que sí, perfecto. En uh, nuestra talk, we will propose an ecological framework to health and We will, sorry, no problem. Okay. And uh, we uh, will discuss the mainstream definition of health. Uh, and uh, we, we think that as a consequence of the emergence of different narratives about the environment during this pandemic, we are obliged to find a different definition of health, which includes the concept of environment. We will propose to characterize the environment through the concepts of pathogenesis and salutogenesis. And the key concept to understand how the environment can be described uh, in, in both this way is the notion of adaptivity, a, a notion coming from philosophy of biology. And we propose adaptivity and a new idea of social adaptivity as key concept to understand the relationship between health and the environment. But let's talk about what is health. Um, uh, I think that everyone in the Faculty of Medicine knows what, what is health. You don't need a philosopher to, to tell you what uh, it is. But uh, the mainstream, one of the mainstream definitions used by both uh, books in medicine and books in, in philosophy of medicine and humanities and social science is the definition given by the WHO World Health Organization in 1948 which says that health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And uh, there are many problems with this definition. Humanities, medical theory and philosophy of medicine have largely discussed the definition of health as well as the concept of disease, illness and sickness And uh, I, I would like to suggest you to read the book recently published by my colleague, Christian Saporido. It's a, it's a book in Spanish called Filosofía de la Medicina, in which all these practical for health professional and theoretical problems, uh, issues of the definition of health and the debate uh, have been clearly presented. And also in, in the book, there is, a, there is a chapter dedicated to ecology uh, and uh, ecological framework to health. And it's, it's from there that we, are, we have started talking together and uh, uh, creating this talk and this paper. And uh, we have talked that uh, one of the big uh, problem in, in the conceptualization of health in this moment in philosophy of medicine, but in humanities and uh, in, in, in other um, branches is the fact that the role of the environment is, uh, is, has been poorly taken into, into account. Yes, there is a problem with me. Okay. 
Um, and instead, environment is one of the emerging issues of uh, this pandemic, not just because there are ecological issues, but for the same origin and, sp and, and spreading of this virus. And consequently, we consider that as a first step is, is to provide a better definition of health, which includes the environment. And we have found this document by the WHO in 1984, that's 40 uh, years after the first definition, in which health is defined as the extent to which an individual or group is able to realize aspiration and satisfy needs and to change or cope with the environment. Health is a resource for everyday life, not the objective of living. It is a positive concept, emphasizing social and personal resources, as well as physical capacities. And uh, we want to, to underline that the two important elements in this definition are cope and the environment. Let's start from the environment. Here is a, another mainstream definition from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Environment is defined as the complex of physical, chemical, and biotic factors that act upon an organism or an ecological community and ultimately determine its form and survival. Okay, this is a classical one, but we think that we need more. And as a philosopher, we need, I think, to use uh, system theory and system uh, ecology because they, they define the environment, they, they help to conceptualize the environment as an integrated and organized whole in which the parts, and we are also part of the environment, are not added yet are dependent on one another in a non-linear way. And the idea of the environment during the COVID-19 has to be analyzed according to us, in this sense, as the pandemic has complexified and questioned our idea of the environment. But uh, there are many narrations about the environment in, during these this last months. Uh, we will focus today on one of the most uh, powerful, most strong, and it is, it, it's uh, the one about patho pathogenesis. And so, the description of the environment as carrier of disease or pathogens or viruses. Pathogenesis is, is as most health professionals know, is the development of morbid conditions or of disease, more specifically the cellular events and reactions and other pathological mechanisms occurring in the development of disease. Well, we think that one of the most important, most, most powerful, most recurrent all over the media uh, characterization of the environment in this last month is the one related to pathogenesis. And the origin of the COVID has, has been described as zoonosis, spillover, the evolution of the viruses. The environment is, has been described as carrier of viruses as a, and as a menace for human beings. This, for example, is, is a is, is uh, from the United uh, Nations Environment Program, in which is, is, it's true, is described that zoonoses are disease transmitted from animals to human, and they comprise the 60% of all infection disease in humans and the 75% of all emerging uh, infectious disease. It is true, we, we cannot be naive to not say, do not consider this, but it, it's not just is just one side of the of the environment and if uh, uh, traditionally the relationship between health and the environment is understood in terms of an agent as an organism that has to face external potential dangers and thus the environment is primarily described as a carrier of pathogens we have to understand that the the, the role of the environment in a wider way how we think that uh, the environment can be described and uh, as a possible description as uh, pathogenic, but the environment is also salutogenic. Well, uh, salutogenesis is, uh, is a term that comes from Latin salus, uh, salute, uh, it means uh, uh, health, so carrier of health. Salutogenesis, as uh, we'll, we'll explain in the, in the other slide, is a term introduced uh, in 1971, uh, 79, sorry, 
by the medical doctor and sociologist Antonovsky. And salutogenesis refers to uh, uh, the fact that uh, we have to find the, the way to uh, provide health. And in this sense, Antonovsky questioned the individualistic and disease-based approach uh, in medicine, and he focused on the origins of health and well-being versus the origins of disease and risk factors. Thus, salutogenesis is based on resources for health and health promotion, promoting processes. And applied to our discussion, well, sal salutogenesis is, a, for example, salutogenic is a term that is, is used uh, a lot in, nowadays in environmental psychology to uh, analyze how the environment and the landscape specifically can uh, um, provide health and well-being for, for human beings. And applied to our discussion, it means that we have to take into account how the other phase of the environment is based on daily actions to improve health both from the environment and the human being, because they are now separated. And uh, as a philosopher, we have to, to understand how these two characterization of the environment are related. And we think that the notion of adaptivity could be, uh, could be an interesting tool, a conceptual and practical tool, because uh, adaptivity, as Christian will explain later, is a concept that we take from philosophy of biology, and usually adaptivity is a system capacity to adjust to changes in the environment without endangering its essential organization. So the fact that the, 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 we stress the, the word adjust and cope. And in general, biology, biological organisms include dedicated regulatory mechanisms that compensate for possible perturbation in ecology could be disturbances and keep the state of the system within certain ranges of viability. So we will use this concept of adaptivity and we will widen it to social adaptivity to better explain the interrelation between health and the environment during the COVID-19 and the EOP during a post-pandemic era. But from now on, Christian Saborido will continue the, the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much, Laura. So I'm going to start my, my part in this talk by explaining this, what, what is this idea of, of adaptivity. So as Laura has said, adaptivity or the concept of adaptivity of organisms has very well studied in theoretical biology and in philosophy of biology. Unfortunately, we do not have so much time now, so we can only sketch a very general characterization of, of this concept, but hopefully we, we think or we hope it will serve to, to understand what adaptivity is and to show the, the implication of this concept for the question of the relationship between health and the, and the environment. So in very general terms, adaptivity is, is this is a property of living organisms that can be defined in this way as the capacity to adjust to changes in the environment without endangering its essential organizations. And organisms, in this sense, organisms are seen as uh, entities that can only live with boundary conditions that allow their self-maintenance. In other words, for life, it's necessary a relationship between the organism and the environment that make it possible, a very specific kind of, of relationship. I'm gonna try to explain this with some examples. For instance, uh, we can see this image from a paper by Xavier Barandiaran and, and Matthew Ebert. This image shows us that it is possible to trace possible viable trajectories that an organism can implement to face possible to face possible changes in the amount of food and water in the environment. This is the idea of this, this image. That is an organism survives in environments with certain amounts of water and food while it dies in other environments. However, organisms are not simply passive entities. Living beings have the capacity to regulate their internal processes and their relation with the environment to stay within these viable trajectories. 
that these living beings have the capacity to adapt to a certain extent, of course, to changes in the environment. And this capacity, this capacity to, to adapt is what we call adaptivity. There are many examples of adaptive regulation or adaptive behaviors in, in organisms. For me, it's very important to note, to, to take into account that adaptivity of living organisms is a phenomenon that occurs in a very diverse ways and at all levels of biological organization. But I don't know, a very clear example is, is this one, the, the, the case of uh, body temperature regulation in the case of fever or, or a very cold weather. This is a very paradigmatic example of adaptive regulation or adaptive behavior on, on organism. But there are many other examples, for instance, I don't know, the, the chemotaxis in, in organisms as sample as, as bacteria. This is a very, uh, very direct example of uh, adaptive regulation. Or uh, even the capacity of regulation and adaptation can really be seen in processes as basics, as fundamentals as the lack of peron. So all these examples are very well studied in, in scientific literature and I don't know, we recommend the, the works by Leonardo Vig, Keparmin Mirazo, Alvaro Moreno, Matteo Mosio, and co-workers, because they, they studied this, this phenomenon of regulation and adaptivity very, very deeply. And the connection between this idea of adaptivity and the, the notion of health, I think is quite obvious. You know? The idea is that um, a healthy organism would be one capable of adapting its environment. So an, uh, an organism with good or with a normal adaptivity would be a health organism. This is a, I don't know, the first intuition about how to connect this idea of adaptivity with the general definition of health. So, of course, this idea is not new, it's not a novel idea. And uh, in fact, in, in very, very recently, The Lancet published an editorial entitled precisely what is health, the, the ability to adapt. And during this, in this letter, the, the Lancet emphasizes the conceptual connection between the notion of adaptivity and, and health. This is a very important uh, work, uh, very, very influential in, in theory of medicine. Uh, However, in this presentation, we will argue that this idea of organismic adaptivity has certain, certain has limitations. So it's, it's not very good to understand the relationship between health and the capacity to adapt the environment because it's not, uh, I don't know. Yes. Specifically, we claim that adaptivity according to this definition is only a property of individual organisms. It's not a, a property of society or communities only, it's a property of uh, organisms, specific organisms. And this, um, according to this definition, the environment is understood only as potentially pathogenic. And we propose that activity is also a property of social entities or communities, and that it also serves to understand the salutogenic roles of environment. Then adaptivity is not only an organismic feature or property, it is also a collective property of group of individuals. In other words, there is also a, a social adaptivity. Our hypothesis here is that the environment has both a pathogenic and salutogenic dimension, and that the concept of social adaptivity accounts for both dimensions, both for the pathogenics and the, and the salutogenic dimension. And we will defend that the community-centered medicine it's a very promising tool to understand and promote social adaptivity. So the, the community-centered medicine, we will explain what community-centered medicine is later, refers to the measures of that enhance social adaptivity, that promotes social adaptivity by facing, by facing, by confronting pathogenic environmental aspects and at the same time promoting or empowering the salutogenic factors of the, of the environment. Then, Social adaptivity, this notion of social adaptivity, would be a social system's capacity to regulate according to the circumstances, its states, its relationship with the environment, and the environment itself, in order not only to face potential dangers, that is the pathogenic dimension of the environment, but also to transform 
the conditions of the individual environment relationship, relationship to promote health. That is the salutogenic dimension of, of the environment. Then, as Laura has explained in the first part of the talk, the environment has, in, in addition to a pathogenic potential, a salutogenic dimension. We are always insisting in this, in this aspect because we think it's a very, very important to understand the relationship between organisms and the environment and between the notion of health and disease to the notion of, of environmental, uh, environmental influence. So as Antonovsky has pointed out, this salutogenic dimension questions, challenges the individualistic and disease-based approach in medicine. And it's opposed to, to the pathogenetical approach in, in philosophy of, of biology. An approach that addresses the salutogenic dimension should focus on the origins of health and well-being rather than only on the origins of disease and risk factors. In other words, the salutogenic approach focuses on resources for health and health promoting processes, emphasizing, for instance, the role of prevention, the need of preventive medicine, or the importance of health education in medicine. And from this point of view, uh, health is not so much an issue that affects only to internal organizations, but a process within an environment. Antonovsky and, and his followers, such as Lindstrom and, and Jenstrom, the authors of this, of this image, have explained this uh, salutogenesis of environment appealing to a metaphor that they call the, the river of life, you know, the metaphor of the river of life. According to this metaphor, it is not enough to promote health by avoiding stress or by building bridges, keeping people from falling into the river or helping people from drawing into the river because medicine has to help people to swim. That's the, the metaphor. From uh, promotion, health education and preventive medicine, uh, medicine has the, the obligation or the goal to improve well-being or to improve health in, in people. Not only to avoid disease, but to promote quality of life. This is the, uh, the metaphor of the of the health uh, of the river of life in, in this in this in this approach. So, in okay, we think that in this moment of health crisis, uh, and also thinking about uh, we hope a very close post-pandemic scenario, the importance of protective and preventive action seems pretty obvious. In order to avoid the risk we are living. Now we can think of the social distancing measures or the medical research we, we are promoting or the public health policies that are being implemented all over the world. And also for empowering people in the relationship with the environment. And in this sense, it's, it's essential to take measures that promote the recognition of the biodiversity, for instance, or the community-centered medicine urban actions, such as the landscape evidence-based design of private and and public buildings. So, okay, and um, in this slide, we consider that this is very, very necessary, it's especially urgent to demand a community-centered medicine. Uh, the last March was uh, a group of specialists from the Hospital of Bergamo, in, in, and that time was the, the European city most affected by the, by the, uh, by the COVID published a very moving letter in the New England Journal of Medicine where they call for, for a change of perspective by the scientific community and the, and the political leaders. The, the letter is very, very moving, it's very impressive. I recommend you, I strongly recommend you, you if you don't know it. And in this, in this letter, the, this group of specialists denounced the inadequacy of the patient-centered medicine and called for its replacement with what they call community-centered care or community-centered medicine. Uh, okay, it is worth to note that the community-centered medicine approach is not uh, confronting the person-centered approach. It's more a kind of complement of this uh, person-centered medicine. Uh, the community-centered medicines uh, aims to complement, 
to, to help person-centered medicine with effective measures such as home care, mobile clinics, or the limitation of hospitalization to a specific target of patients. And these measures have already proven to be very effective in the, in the decreasing of contagion. I think it's very important to say that. It's a change of perspective, but uh, it's a call for, for a wider focus of the concept of medicine, on the concept of uh, assistant care. And we believe that this Italian experience, this uh, Italian call for attention, shows the importance of a community center medicine. In fact, we can, we would like to defend that this COVID-19 crisis can be an opportunity to vindicate a medicine that not only serves to combat a potential crisis in the future, but also to implement permanent measures that improve environmental salutogenesis. For instance, the accessible healthy space and landscapes or better aired buildings or promote hard washing, facilitate healthy lifestyles to be more infection resistant and so on and so on. There are many possible uh, permanent measures that can be implemented to promote salutogenesis and not only to avoid potential uh, pathogenical factors of the environment, such as the, the virus. The... Okay, and that's all. We, we, we have this, this conclusion, these very preliminary conclusions of our approach. First of all, we propose to, to reconsider. We think that it's only very important to reconsider the, the environment as salutogenic not only as a carrier of diseases or pathogens, but only as, as a possible uh, carrier of health or promoting of health. And according to this approach, environment is our daily setting, both urban and natural landscape. The landscape is our environment of proximity. That is, environment is the place in which we perceive and in which we are agents. It is not something detached from us. It's not something can, that can be pure or dangerous, but it's only that belongs to us. And a community center medicine, we, we claim is something necessary to, to promote social adaptivity, facing environmental pathogenic factors and promoting its salutogenic potential. I think this is a, more or less the, the take home message of our talk here, you know, the, how is the, the necessity, the need to trace connection between the idea of social adaptivity, the notion of environmental salutogenesis, and the, the tool, very useful tool of uh, community center medicine to promote social adaptivity, to, to recognize and empower the salutogenic factors of the environment. I think that's all. Thank you so much. This, there are some references about that and our email is has the heart of something. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Cristian y Laura. Rendiamos las preguntas al panel de preguntas después de esta charla. Eh, le recordamos que también pueden hacer sus preguntas a través de la chat. La siguiente ponencia es virus, patologías y vida la normatividad de la salud y la enfermedad en un contexto relacional. La charla será dictada por Arancha Echeverría, profesora titular de Filosofía de la Ciencia y Filosofía de la Biología de la Universidad del País Vasco. Forma parte del grupo de investigación IAS Research Center for Life, Mind and Society, en la misma universidad. Sus áreas de investigación son los conceptos de individualidad y autonomía en biología y en medicina, en relación a los sistemas, organismos, ambiente, organización biológica y su evolución desde una perspectiva evolutionary y developmental. Muchas gracias, Arancha. Eh, 
Bueno, buenos días eh, para Chile y buenas tardes eh, aquí en, en Europa. Um, like the previous uh, uh, talk, I, I will continue in English. And I'm very happy to, to be here and very grateful to the organizers for having uh, um, put together such a wonderful event. And um, I would like to, to warn that um, rather than than a proper philosophical argument. My talk uh, is going to be a philosophical uh, outline of issues that uh, are important uh, for, for COVID-19, for, for the pandemics uh, that um, um, we are uh, living these days, from uh, uh, the point of view of, uh, of a philosopher of biology and philosophy, philosopher of medicine um, like uh, I am. So, My first uh, start is this uh, question, what is this uh, COVID-19 uh, disease? And uh, well, it's clear that uh, thinking on the COVID-19 pandemics requires to, 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 to refine our thoughts about uh, health uh, and disease. And uh, this refinement, uh, I will try to, to, to um, share some thoughts uh, for, for it. Uh, from the point of view of two aspects. One is the role of values and normative evaluations, something that uh, is uh, classical in, in, in the philosophical discussion of concepts of uh, health and disease. And the other, the, the individual and the collective levels, how they can complement. And uh, I will try to zoom out from individuals to a very more global picture, takes into account community, society and nature and then zoom in back to, to the individual um, as, a, as a way of uh, thinking about uh, these uh, problems. Um, my talk uh, is going to be um, um, organized in eight uh, statements uh, that uh, will try to, to do some kind of uh, portrait of uh, things that I think are important to, to consider this, uh, this uh, situation. And the uh, last one, or uh, uh, the nine, that uh, will try to, to provide some very um, general uh, conclusion. Well, the first one is um, that health and disease are attributed to, to the organisms. They, they are um, concepts that are normally thought in terms of organisms. And in fact, uh, both in the philosophy of biology and in the philosophy of medicine, there have been several attempts uh, lately to recuperate the centrality of the individual organism to overcome, or the person in medicine, to overcome the reductionist ontologies that derive from gene-centered accounts. So uh, concepts that are important in the philosophy of medicine um, around the notion of organisms are uh, such as uh, homeostasis, function, or living uh, organization. Um, all of them always taking into account that we are going to say that something is uh, healthy or is a disease uh, about a, an individual. Uh, my my thoughts about uh, health and disease have been very much shaped by uh, George Canguillem, a philosopher of, of medicine, who considered that uh, nevertheless the organism has to be thought as a relational being. He says one must understand that the relationship between the organism and the environment is the same as that between the parts and the whole of an organism. So when we say organism, Kangiem says, we have to think of it in relation to the environment. And um, well, we can say that in his thought, in Kangiem's thought, we have to start by, by thinking on living organization as the regulation of uh, parts. Uh, and then that, uh, that uh, organization has to be thought in relation to, to the environment, and it's there to or milieu, like he says, and it's there that where values are going to come up because uh, not all the environments uh, have the same value for, for the organism, and the organism is going to be healthier in some of them, and there are going to be differences in, in, uh, in health and disease uh, in different organisms according to the organism relationship that uh, is uh, established. And the third important topic uh, uh, that comes from Kangiem and I think is important is that uh, 
health and disease um, are not uh, static uh, uh, situations or, or states, but are um, processes that can be thought as developmental trajectories uh, that uh, uh, in which uh, the, the normativity of, uh, of what is interesting or healthy or what is uh, pathological or, or uh, comes uh, with a, a trouble or is something bad for, bad for the organism is pu always punctuated by, by episodes of disease and recovery and mortality eventually in the case of the individual. So the second uh, statement would be that the organism has to be thought in relation to, to the environment. And there is an important recognition of, 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 environmental, of the environmental influence in biology and in medicine today, like uh, it was also explained in the previous uh, talk, and also in some of the talks that we were uh, listening yesterday. And especially um, with an emphasis on the interconnectedness of uh, individuals and uh, in the idea that the biological constitution of organism organisms has to be understood in relation to, to environments. And these environments will include the social and the ecological. So this relation Laura, biology, de, de, the, de, 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 eh, no está compartiendo su pantalla. Si la puede compartir, por favor. Ah, no, perdón. Ahora. Ahora full screen, por favor. Ahí sí, muchas gracias. Lo siento, pues eh, no sé qué, no sé qué ha pasado. Eh, Tengo que empezar desde el principio o puedo continuar. No, continuar, ningún problema. Sí. Ah, okay. So, so uh, this is uh, this this brings us to to the importance of the relational the concept of relational biology uh, like uh, lots of uh, some of the talks yesterday for example luisa damiano was uh, mentioned all the time the relational thinking that uh, in the case of health and disease it's going to 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 give us the idea that organisms are embedded in environment and uh, also they embody uh, environmental influences because there is a full interconnectedness of the living realm and other living entities. In the case of uh, biology, uh, some fields like symbiosis, uh, those studying symbiosis or epigenetics are, are particularly sensitive, sensible to, to this, sensitive to this uh, kind of uh, uh, approach. Well, the, the, thir the third statement is that uh, we can uh, consider, uh, all of us uh, know, that um, uh, the cause of the, of the pandemic is a virus called SARS-CoV-2. And, uh, and that virus, uh, are, uh, viruses have been, consider, uh, have been uh, looked uh, in, the, for the lay in the lay understanding as very, very weird creatures. For example, Arundhati Roy, a writer, Indian writer, said uh, in a paper published in, in April, who can look at anything anymore, a door handle, a, a cardboard carton, a bag of vegetables, without imagining it, it swarming with those unseeable, undead, and living blobs dotted with suction pads waiting to fasten themselves onto to our lungs. Uh, it's probably the size of the of the viruses, uh, which are, uh, as you know, very very small, or also the kind of uh, uh, replication uh, rates that they have, which are uh, exponential, that make them um, um, entities that are, are quite um, unheimly, uh, so to say, or or, or not uh, easily accommodating to to, the, to our intuitions of what uh, reality uh, is. But uh, the thing is that uh, viruses are also strange for science, not only for, for la the lay, lay knowledge. And there have been many discussions of what they are, about whether they are alive, whether they, they're linked, to, whether they're inevitably linked to pathology, uh, whether they have a role uh, in relation to, to other living forms or, or in evolution. And um, 
In fact, uh, the, the, the views of viruses uh, have been changing in the last uh, 50 years. Only, uh, only some two, th four decades ago, the two, uh, the Gene and Peter Medawar were writing that uh, a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in, in proteins. So they were defining the, the virus as, uh, as some kind of genetic uh, information, uh, which uh, um, was wrapped in proteins but had no metabolism or not replicating machinery. And uh, that information was considered to be inevitably bad. So they say no virus is known to do good. So uh, somehow we, um, the, the study of uh, viruses start with the consideration that uh, it's something bad, it's something harmful that we have to know in order to, to defend ourselves from, from it. Uh, later, uh, in the last uh, few decades, there has been a more descriptive view that considers the uh, viruses in a more sort of neutral way, not only patho as uh, um, transmitters of uh, infectious diseases, but, but uh, also as uh, important um, uh, actors of, of evolution. Uh, nevertheless, uh, most of them are still often classified, classified according to the pathologies they are associated with. with. And uh, they are a lot, there are a lot of varieties and, and there are a lot of uh, entities, uh, more than prokaryotic cells. And um, well, the, it's, uh, their classification in terms of uh, evolutionary cladistic, for example, is, uh, is uh, still uh, not completely done. So it's uh, really a, a, an entity that um, is, um, is still under, under lots of uh, research. But uh, in any case, um, the virus is uh, related to, to infectious diseases. And infectious diseases uh, are not, uh, should not uh, be considered, at least from the point of view of the history of uh, medicine, uh, not only uh, as not only caused by by that uh, entity the, the virus but also also uh, related to social relations or at least to changes in social relations uh, we need to take into account that uh, uh, only uh, only 12000 years ago there were no infectious diseases among uh, among uh, humans because the uh, hunter gatherers had a style of life in which their life was probably very tough and, uh, and they, 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 they lived in very, very small groups, but uh, the kind of uh, living that they had was, uh, was um, one in which there were no infectious, infectious diseases because they had not the, the required host for, for easy tra transmission of, of uh, infections. So infectious diseases start in the history of, uh, the human, of human life around 12,000 years ago, and they are uh, associated with sedentary life, with agriculture, cattle farming, with, with uh, a, a situation in which there is more food, but the food is of a much more poorer quality, and in close contact with uh, animals. Because um, most uh, of the infectious diseases are, are uh, always uh, associated with uh, zoonosis, that is transmission from, from animals to 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 humans and um, and uh, uh, um, they are they are uh, uh, always uh, dependent of, of the social conditions in which uh, they they happen this uh, is something that uh, we have also seen in the pandemics uh, we have seen that um, risk groups uh, uh, can um, can be um, characterized by, by their individual uh, differences of, the, of organisms, that is constitutive uh, differences uh, according to their age or whether they are male or female or immune factors or differences in self-care and the kind of conservation that the individual has had. But uh, um, the infection uh, also has to do with, this, with social differences that affect the chances of for exposure. Like uh, also uh, the, in the previous uh, talk, uh, uh, the speakers were, were saying. So, um, because uh, most of the measures, apart from possible uh, vaccines or or uh, cure of cure of, or cures that can be developed, involve uh, 
social measures of, um, of uh, limitations of, of environmental exposure and isolation, not everyone can protect themselves. So uh, the, 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 the disease is um, inevitably linked to, to social uh, conditions. Uh, so the social is uh, a, a biological or environmental factor of, of disease, as we have seen uh, uh, by looking at the history of uh, medicine. Um, and that means that uh, when we think of the role of science to, to, to study, to think of what to do with the pandemics and to help uh, and to be normative about uh, the measures to, to take, uh, we should include uh, social sciences and humanities in, in, within sciences because uh, not only bi biologists and microbiologists can help with the disease, it is important to, to take into account that uh, in great uh, measure, in a great degree, um, the, the disease has to do with uh, social conditions. And uh, also uh, it is important uh, to understand that uh, that the social um, um, affects the, the health and, and disease of, of individual as looping effects uh, of, uh, of feedback. So um, social and environmental effects uh, uh, oblique or, or, or like uh, Engel suggested uh, nearly 40 years ago to, to think on, on a change in the, in the model of, of medicine, at least from, from, a bio, from the biomedical one, to, the, to a more complex one that will take into account the social um, in the biopsychosocial or, um, or, or better uh, in a model that takes into account that biology is a complex uh, phenomenon that, takes into, that uh, includes and encompasses social phenomena. So uh, one, uh, after, after the, uh, the appearance of uh, infectious uh, diseases, the solution of medicine was to, to establish a war against microbes, and that has happened in the last uh, uh, 150 or 200 years, uh, when the awareness of pathological effects of microbes, including viruses, uh, start, uh, the germ theory of uh, diseases to find, and people and uh, uh, medical and biological um, scientists like Koch, Pasteur and others start to, to develop vaccines and antibiotics to, to defend or prevent uh, infectious uh, diseases. Um, from the point of view of the social history of medicine, some, some um, researchers have said that we can distinguish three rough kinds of receipts, diseases, those that are innate or congenital, the infectious one and, and the infectious ones and those that are human made made and uh, uh, there is a, some kind of tradition that starts from Abdel Omran and uh, has been very much discussed in this uh, uh, social histories of medicine of considering that um, the, the evolution of uh, human diseases can be characterized uh, as some kinds of uh, transitions in which um, the first one, starting around 12 years, 12,000 years ago, as I said before, originates with agriculture and farming and brings about the, uh, the, the, the transmission of uh, infections and, and epidemics in, in human life. The Omran, Abdel Omran co called this, uh, this stage the age of pestilence and famine. Uh, with the war against uh, microbes in certain parts of, of, the, of the world, uh, a, a transition, a second transition will have occurred according to, to this uh, model in which uh, population um, don't uh, suffer so much uh, infectious diseases and, and the mortality uh, is uh, mainly produced by degenerative or human-made uh, diseases like uh, smoking or overeating or sedentary life, uh, etc. And uh, some people, uh, like uh, this Harper and Armelagos that I cite uh, uh, here, think that uh, after the second tradition, not, no, not a transition, not everything has uh, improved in medicine because we have a third transition in which there is a return of known and new diseases that expand rapidly, uh, which are some of them are infectious, others are 
linked to 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 lifestyles like uh, human made diseases uh, but expand rapidly because of globalization and, and transport um, although this model of uh, transitions has been very very much um, criticized by many people like for example levins and the wanting think that uh, it is uh, in, not uh, interesting to to think of uh, diseases as something uh, that uh, have uh, disappeared it does um, it does um, help to to think of of medicine as a, as an endeavor that has uh, have some kind of optimism thinking that uh, that uh, infectious diseases were something that uh, that had uh, disappeared and something that we see with these pandemics also people who were considering the whole world especially places like uh, um, in some countries in Africa and other countries uh, that, uh, knew that uh, they were already they were uh, infectious uh, diseases that were that had a very very high rate of mortality uh, even before these pandemics were so so famous. Well, so the last uh, the, the sixth uh, statement would be uh, to take into account that uh, the war against microbes has had very a lot of unwanted consequences. For example, we have antibiotic uh, resistance. Uh, hygiene has had uh, lots of problems like um, uh, immune diseases. And, um, and some people consider that we live now in a post-pasterian age in which after the war, science and medicine need to consider possible collaboration with microbes and uh, to think that rather than enemies, uh, ways of living together have to be found. Uh, this is um, so. In this case, uh, in what concerns viruses, uh, it is clear from this uh, post-pasterian uh, perspective that uh, the metaverse were, were wrong, and that uh, viruses are not only threat but also allies in in co-development, and that uh, um, the role of viruses in evolution is crucial, and and uh, also in the functional biology of uh, multicellular. So we need to explore uh, paradigms of living together. That's it. That is something about uh, which um, uh, an, an anthropologist like uh, Charlotte uh, Brief has been writing a lot. And, um, and uh, the problem is then how to consider the role of microbes uh, in, what res in what respect uh, individual organisms. And that is something that I think is one of the of the tasks of uh, biology and the philosophy of biology for the near future to, to think uh, of uh, what kind of entities um, we have to consider to, to, to do uh, evaluations of health and, and disease. But uh, it is uh, uh, important to, to, and this is my last uh, statement, that disease uh, has also this uh, so ecological dimension because of uh, the appearance of uh, zoonosis has been related to habitat destruction and loss of biodiversity and the ecological dimension is important to, to, re to reverse the damage uh, done. Uh, other anthropologists like Latour or Haraway have also emphasized different uh, kind of uh, aspects of, of this. And um, I very uh, quickly will recapitulate. I have said that uh, health and disease are normally attributed to the organism or at the level of the organism, and but that the organism has to be thought in relation to the environment, that the cause of the pandemic is considered to be this uh, virus, and that uh, infections, diseases origin, but originate in changes in social relations, so that not only the virus, but uh, the change of social relations has to be taken into account when we think of uh, the disease, that uh, the history of medicine has um, done a war against microbes uh, and that war has been the source of a lot of optimism uh, in medicine, but at the same time, we nowadays uh, have lots of unwanted consequences uh, of that war and that uh, now we have to think of the disease in terms of uh, uh, eco the ecological relations and we need to explore paradigms to, of living together. So my last question would be, do concepts of health and disease need now to be extended from the individual to more global entities encompassing the social and the environmental? Well, I remember that uh, Christian has suggested that we should 
And uh, well, I, I just uh, finished this is my last slide. That uh, well, I think that medicine and philosophy needs to deal with the complementarity of a view of life as connected and a view of organisms and their well being, in which life should be considered to be fully connected and interdependent. But uh, we have to know that it is individual organisms, persons, animal, plants, the ones that become ill and require care and cure. And their well-being is what, uh, what really matters. So this, I think that um, I, I suggest that uh, science and medicine needs to iteratively zoom out and zoom in from zoom out from the individual to the global and then zoom in to the, from the global to, to the individual, back to the individual, and also from values to facts, because like uh, in the case of viruses, we start by looking at viruses as uh, pathological and then facts show us that uh, they are not uh, only pathological and, and we can uh, rethink uh, uh, all the problem. So this is uh, my last uh, slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Aranza. Ahora tenemos 10 minutos para preguntas. Así que no sé si hay alguien que quiere hacer una pregunta directamente a Arancha. Acá en la sesión de Question and Answer yo no veo preguntas, pero pueden eh, prender su cámara o hacerla con voz eh, en vivo, en directo, sin escribirla. Eh, preguntas para Laura, Cristian o para Arancha. Eh, Mientras esperamos las primeras preguntas, me quiero decir que me gustó mucho esta sintonía entre las dos charlas, un poco como estaba concluyendo Arancha, ¿no? Donde Cristian eh, concluyó hablando de esta visión más eh, community center, o sea, una medicina que amplíe, que salga de los lugares cerrados de los hospitales, de los consultorios y que vaya en la comunidad. Y Arancha eh, sintonizó con esto finalmente hablando de la visión que tenemos que tener un poco más eh, macro. ¿no? Eh, eh, acá están avisando que no pueden escribir la pregunta. Entonces, ¿quién quiere, tiene preguntas? Si no logran escribirla, la pueden decir en voz alta. Estaremos felices de escucharlos en el idioma que prefieren. Y para concluir mi, mi reflexión, esto como extender estos conceptos, eso me gustó mucho, ampliarlos, ¿no? Y, y esto zoom in, out, es muy, muy potente, muy interesante. Eh, nosotros del área de la salud, realmente nos cuesta un poco hacer este, este zoom y abrirlo a otros aspectos. Ángela, eh, ¿tú tenías una pregunta? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your talks, were very, very interesting. Um, because you show all um, the link between medicine and environment. And my, my question for the, all the participants is um, how can we imagine medicine in the Anthropocene era? Um, because virus, viruses um, will be um, spread out maybe more uh, in in um, in relation to the population of a human beings, all um, uh, which is very uh, also a problem. Um, ecologists uh, say now uh, said in eco and French ecologists um, from the CNRS said that um, the, when a population of, uh, of animals or or human are too much. Uh, um, developed uh, is th something very natural that there is a, a epidemic or pandemic. So uh, how we can uh, face this problem, how can we consider this problem of the pandemic uh, from an ecological point of view uh, in relation with Anthropocene? Well, um, ca can I talk or? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question, uh, Angela. Angela. Um, I think that um, there are some 
uh, aspects that uh, take us to think that uh, the science of the Anthropogene has to be, has to be normative, that uh, the science cannot uh, just uh, describe what happens, but uh, we will have to, to start with uh, values uh, as, uh, in an iterative way from values to facts, but, but also but from values because uh, there are uh, many, uh, many aspects of uh, how nature and the uh, uh, environment is and how it affects uh, our health and disease that uh, we, we need to change and, uh, and um, we will have to, to normatively uh, use all our knowledge to try to, to change it. In what uh, concerns uh, uh, health and, and disease, as I said, I, I think that uh, we, we cannot forget uh, individuals who are ill and, and sick and we cannot just uh, start uh, talking of, uh, of, the, of uh, the ecological problems with, uh, and we have to be zooming in and out from, from the individual to, to all the, the, the problems. But in what concerns research, I have uh, hopes also that um, a, a view of the viruses and microbes in general, that instead of considering them uh, as enemies, considers them as, uh, as, co as people, as colliding entities in, in this world. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is pathological. It's a, it is not uh, beneficial or, or beneficial, it is uh, bad for, for us. But maybe we can change our relations with microbes. Maybe the cure can be found in microbes themselves. Maybe research can, can change uh, the kind of um, 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 scientific uh, goals that uh, they set. If, if, we, if they change the mentality, then instead of, uh, of uh, doing a war against an enemy, um, the research is going to, to take advantage of, of the kind of interactions that we start to know and, uh, and uh, maybe new discoveries and new uh, perspectives can be developed that, uh, that help us in ways that uh, we cannot uh, uh, envisage uh, right now, but, uh, but that I think it will be interesting. Okay. Thank you. I only want to say that I completely agree with Arancha. It's, I think it's a, a very, very good answer. And, and okay, and thank you again for the, for the question, Angela. I think it's very important to say maybe the, the conclusion of both talks uh, can be that in this Anthropocene era, in this new era, it's impossible to separate environment from the organism when we try to understand health and disease. Um, especially in this uh, case, in this crisis of the COVID-19, this is especially clear, it's quite obvious. As Arantxa ha, has explained very, very clearly, the origin of infections and microbes can be due to, to social changes. In the Anthropocene era we are now, we are always changing our environment and our uh, boundary conditions. And this impose, uh, and in this, in this sense of taking this into account, it's very clear that we need to, to take or to adopt an ecological approach to, to health and disease. Of course, because that gives the, the, know, the most important uh, conclusion or the most important uh, message we can take from the Anthropocene era is the, the necessity of taking into account um, a wider perspective for what we are and what, what we can you know, improve our, our way of living. Muchas gracias. Hay otras preguntas, um, dos que me parece que se relacionan. Eh, escriben, para mí es una enseñanza de humildad en invitación a salir del antropocentrismo. Si bien podemos decir que virus y bacterias no tienen conciencia, pero ¿cómo ven el tema de que el ser humano se sienta superior? ¿Es necesario dejar esta superioridad para poder de verdad tener una interrelación sana con el ambiente? Y hay otra pregunta que probablemente se relaciona con esta, que probablemente más con una, eh, para Arancha, que dice si en el paleolítico no había virus 
o si la historia de los virus es una historia de nuestra relación con el ambiente. Bueno, eh, ¿se, ¿se oye o no? ¿Sí? Sí. Eh, Responde en castellano. Sí, okay. sobre la... ¿Sí? ¿Está bien que responda en castellano? Sí, hay traducción. Sí, no en el problem. paleolítico, bueno, no se sabe muy bien cuándo se originaron los virus, pero hay gente que considera que los virus son los primer, las primeras entidades vivientes. Eso significaría que, que, por lo menos en el planeta Tierra, habrían aparecido hace 3.800 millones de, de años, es decir, no en el paleolítico. Lo que estoy diciendo es que en el paleolítico no había infección, no había eh, epidemias, no había eh, enfermedades infecciosas. Eso es lo que la mayor parte de los historiadores de la medicina o antropólogos eh, que han tratado de cuestiones eh, de las relaciones entre los seres vivos, sobre todo eh, con los gérmenes, han dicho que, que no es que, por ejemplo, si alguien en el paleolítico se, se caía y se hacía una herida terrible, no es que no, no fuera a infectarse la herida y morir de una de una infección masiva, sino que esa, esa infección no se transmitía eh, eh, como se puede transmitir eh, más tarde, cuando, cuando de alguna manera la relación social de hacinamiento, de, de cercanía, cuando la población humana ha crecido enormemente y, 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 y la cercanía eh, es, eh, es, eh, es propicia para, para, para la infección. Bueno, no solo es propicia, sino que también cuando, cuando se, a, se asocia a un cambio en el entorno. Entonces, claro, los virus. Es que no se sabe. De, eh, hay varias teorías sobre, sobre el origen de los virus. Algunos consideran que los virus degeneran a partir de seres vivos. Otros consideran que los virus estaban en el origen de, de la vida y que toda la vida en realidad pro, procede de elementos como los virus. Y, y, y hay otros... Bueno, hay como tres teorías eh, distintas, pero eso es lo que yo quería decir. Eh, la otra pregunta es posible que sea más para vosotros, eh, Laura. ¿no? Muchas gracias, Aranza. Sí, es verdad que, bueno, hay, hay un problema de antropocentrismo, pero... Um, yo, yo tendo siempre a, a, a ver un poco la, la, el, el, el evento positivo, el positive side of, uh, of life, eh, eh, a, a, aunque estamos en un, en, en un momento muy, muy complicado. Es verdad que el antropocentrismo, especialmente en, la, en las éticas ambientales o la filosofía del medio ambiente o la filosofía del paisaje, ha sido muy, eh, muy discutido, muy debatido y muy criticado en lo, a, a partir de los 70, ¿no? de los 70 del año del, del, del siglo pasado. Entonces, tenemos todos los instrumentos teóricos para, uh, para, para poner en discusión el antropocentrismo y lo podemos hacer. Yo creo también, un poco conectándome a lo que ha dicho Ángela antes, uh, lo, lo podemos hacer uh, también en este momento de, 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 de antropoceno um, a través de un, una, una mejor colaboración interdisciplinaria. Eh, eh, creo que un poco eh, la, la, nuestra charla ha, ha intentado ir en, en esta dirección. Eh, es verdad que eh, la mayoría de los investigadores ahora, el CNRS en Francia también, eh, pone muchísimo en guardia sobre el antropoceno, es eh, absolutamente importante. Lo que a veces ha faltado, tanto en la investigación como más en la práctica, es un trabajo que sea interdisciplinario y transdisciplinario. Eso significa, por ejemplo, que eh, bueno, ha, ha salido en Francia unos, unos investigadores que estaban trabajando sobre el, 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 la SARS eh, antes del, del, de la explosión de la pandemia, no tenían fun, fondos y recursos para seguir con esta, con esta investigación. Pero significa también que eh, hay algo que necesitamos que hacer en, en, el, en el territorio, sobre, sobre el territorio. Y por eso yo creo, tanto la, los psicólogos, tanto los biólogos, tanto los, la, la ciencia humana eh, tienen que colaborar para, para hacer frente a, a, a crisis que, 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 que se puedan desarrollar. Y, y yo creo que en, en la, la, la propuesta, eh, especialmente en este momento de la... De la Community Center Medicine, eh, va en este, en, en, un poco en esta dirección. No hemos tenido mucho el tiempo de desarrollar qué significa 
um, eh, desarrollar al máximo una, una, una medicina basada en, en la comunidad. Significa no, no solamente enfocarnos en, en, en el hospital, más en la práctica cotidiana de la promoción de la salud. Esta práctica pasa también para el diseño lugares para nuestras ciudades y todo el tema enorme que hay, por ejemplo, en medicina sobre la evidence-based design de, de los lugares. Entonces, eh, tenemos todas las posibilidades, eh, to, todos los recursos intelectuales, eh, y ya lo hemos 